Hey everyone, welcome to today's Authors at Google Talk. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Gordon Bell and Jim Gemmel. Uh, they're the authors of Total Recall, which is coming out this week, I believe. Last week, oh, congratulations. It uh, details their decade-long experiment with recording uh, as many waking moments of Gordon's life as possible. Um, this is happening at Microsoft Research. It's called My Life Bits, and we're looking forward to having them tell us more. So please join me in welcoming uh, Gordon Bell and Jim Gemmel. I'm losing my mind, and so is everybody else. Uh, as you age, it's a phenomenon of just getting a little bit older. And we use things like this to remember where you parked or anything you can, lists, grocery lists, whatever, are ways of uh, dealing with this. What we're tr speculating is what if you could remember everything and what are the tools that you need to do that? So it's really everything you've ever read, everything you've ever seen, and everything you've ever heard. And so that really became the mantra of the, of the project that we did. This was a quote by uh, Bill Gates in a 1995 uh, article, uh, book that he wrote. Um, and then we're, as we got into the project, we found there was just much more to just beyond what you heard heard and seen, but it was all of the ambience around you. That is everything from, lo especially location, on through your total environment. And sensors are everywhere. So if you want, you can have total recall when you have all of that and can get access to it. And as we all recall, there are three reasons or three technologies that are driving this. One is simply the ability, we can record it. There are devices out there. The digital camera probably being the most important that has caused everybody to, to need to do it. Uh, in addition, there are more, more and more devices all of the time being uh, put on us, uh, and uh, including, uh, uh, all, especially all of the cameras, the various cameras and uh, particularly the, uh, the new Apple Nano iPhone. And then storage, the second component, namely that it's abundant and cheap. You know, it's enabling our companies and to do the amazing things that we can do by store, being able to store everything. And then finally, as you guys know, the issue is you've got to be able to get it back. So search is a a key part of being able to deal with the recall. So we believe total recall is inevitable. And Jim is going to talk about some of the details of it. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, so we do th believe total recall is inevitable. And in the book, we're talking about not just our experience with my life bits, but about what's possible. And we tried to write it in a way accessible to the lay person and get the general public excited about what this could mean for their lives. And also to get people to see the business opportunities here, that there's going to be a building demand in the general public to do something with all this data I'm churning out and take advantage of it. So Total Recall starts today. It's already taking off. And we're going to see within 10 years it should be full blown and something that's already shaking our society. Now, to be clear, what we're not talking about is life blogging. Uh, of course, there's people out there like the Jenny, Jenny Cam and all these different sites where people are putting their whole life on the web. And if you like doing that, go ahead. Um, we think it's kind of crazy, risky. We don't do it. What we're more like is these diaries with the locks on them. It's my stuff. I want to keep it. I want to keep it safe. Uh, it's for my benefit. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about our experience and how we uh, got into this. It started in 1999. We were actually working on telepresence. And Gordon, wanting to be a good teleworker, uh, said, I can't drag my filing cabinets around with me everywhere. So he started scanning all his paper. And then we said, well, why just paper? Uh, what if you digitize everything you possibly could and put it on your hard drive? 
At the time, we were, uh, it was about 2001 by now, and we were saying, gee, we'll all have terabytes by about 2007. What could we stick on those things? And we said, well, we could keep all our email, and we could record every web page we see, and we could scan a bunch of paper every day, and roll audio for eight hours, and uh, take 10 photos, and it would take us, uh, take us five years to fill up our 80 gig drives, and by then we'll have terabyte drives that will uh, last us another 65 years. So at that point, we're like, wow, a whole life on a terabyte. Now, mind you, since then, our expectations have gone way up. So 10 photos a day isn't enough anymore, nor is that amount of audio and so on. But uh, we, we sort of, we call this now 20th century resolution. So this would have impressed anybody in the 20th century if they actually had this much of their life. And you could put that on a terabyte. So off goes Gordon to become I am data, uh, pulling paintings and posters down off the walls, uh, scanning metals, which turn out to go really nice on a scanner instead of trying to get the lighting just so with a, with a camera, uh, old home videos, notebooks. Here's the uh, memo proposing the VAX architecture. All kinds of goodies go into that big collection. And it ends up with a whole bunch of stuff. So if we count the number of items, there's a lot of emails, there's a lot of pictures, there's a lot of web pages. But if you go by space, video, audio, and pictures dominate. And uh, relatively speaking, Gordon doesn't even have that much video. So really, the picture we ended up with is, in the, in the future, it's we've got all our video, and oh yeah, we've got that little blip of the other stuff. You know, probably audio and pictures are in, in, the, in the story there too, but uh, the dominance of media there. So, now he's got it, what can he do with it? Can he ever find anything? Can he organize anything? Once you find it, would you know what it is? Gordon pulled up some photos and he goes, wow, great picture. I have no idea what that's a picture of. And if you found it once, could you find it again? So eventually Gordon wanders into my office grumbling, ah, it's all just a bunch of bits. I can't do anything with this. Our boss, Jim Gray, asked us, uh, have you guys invented the right once, read never memory? <laughs> so with encouragement like that, I got involved and uh, started building a system, putting everything in a database and starting to build up a suite of applications that would record everything we could, beginning with sucking in our files, having somewhere to search and browse, adding comments with text or by speaking, capturing a copy of every web page we see, not just the URL, but the actual page, recording our instant messenger chats, sucking in our emails, recording telephone. Gordon's office was set up to say, recording is the first thing you hear when you call, so that California law is satisfied and you can opt out and hang up if you want. We played with recording TV and radio. Uh, in the end, we thought it's not so interesting to keep copies of all the shows because we believe everything will be on demand eventually. But what is interesting is to keep a log of what you're watching and when you watched it. Um, screen savers are perhaps the killer app. Once you have so much stuff, you can't even remember you have it all to go look for it. And so something needs to just bring it up by random and, and let you enjoy the stuff. And when it's there, you have to capture the moment and be able to rate things and comment on them. Uh, GPS, sense cam I'll talk about in a moment, and finally GUI logging where we were recording everything that goes on on our desktops and what we're doing with our PCs. I'm wearing a sense cam here. This is invented by Lindsay Williams who used to be in our Cambridge lab. And um, what it is is a camera that's designed to take pictures automatically at a quote unquote good time. So it has a light level sensor and if I walk out this room to outdoors in the sunshine, it'll notice the light levels change. It'll say, something's different, let's take a picture of it. It has a passive infrared uh, sensor like a burglar alarm. And so if it detects a warm body, it says, oh, there's a person in front of you, take a picture. It has accelerometers, so if it's jiggling around, it'll say, let's wait to take that picture so I don't get a blurry one. Here's Gordon armed with sense cam and voice recorder, his standard issue equipment. and. Uh, Here's putting things together in time-lapse uh, video of a friend riding around in Cambridge, England, so you can condense your day and see a quick overview of what you're doing. Great for uh, vacations. The other thing that happens is when you automatically capture, you get moments that you'd never otherwise capture. Um, 
I have here, these are some of my favorite sense cam moments. Uh, the top is a sequence of having lunch with Peter Hart, who heads the RICO Innovations. And he has these very vivid gestures and so on. And you would, there's no way I could kind of capture that feeling of having lunch with Peter apart from doing something like this. Or on the right, I have the moment that I first ever met Ben Schneiderman, the uh, user interface guru. And that's him walking up and, and reaching out to shake my hand. Um, and I would never have pulled a camera out and snapped that, but I've got it. And a number of other special moments. One is meeting, you know, bumping into a colleague by accident at a hotel check-in desk. Uh, there's a fellow named Cahill Gurren at uh, Dublin City University who decided to wear a sense cam constantly for a year, um, you know, every waking moment. He thought, this would be a crazy experiment, and when it's all over, I want to throw that thing away. But actually, when the year ended, he wouldn't give it back, and he's still wearing it to date. And I think uh, he had about 800,000 photos in the first year, and he's up to several million by now. Um, but anyhow, Cahill said to me, that he captured the moment where he first met his girlfriend, but of course he didn't know that she would become his girlfriend. So these are the kind of moments we get when we have automatic capture. And instead of being the typical story of, you know, the parent takes a lot of photos of the first child, and then a little less of the second child, and it goes down because you actually want to live, you don't want to just be the cameraman, and then the fourth child has to go to therapy for why didn't daddy love me. Um, this way, you, you get to capture it and enjoy what you're doing. So of course, capturing where you, where you walk, recording your meetings. Uh, this is tracking what's going on a PC, so showing hour by hour how much is the PC usage and what are the top programs being used and files being accessed. So in the end, My Life Bits isn't a product, it's just a proof of concept, and in fact, it's a suite of applications, as I explained. Uh, and we also started a larger research community with the, the Carpe Research Group, and we funded 14 universities and gave them our software and sense cams. And they did a bunch of wonderful work and all, came up with all kinds of things we could have never thought of. I like to, to boast on their work a bit, and I'll show a bit of it uh, later on. But we, we got enough of a picture to say, look, we see where we're headed here, and we know that we really want it. We think it's very compelling. So now I want to tell you some of the benefits of Total Recall. I don't have time to get into all of them, but um, let me do a few. I'll talk about memory and health and life and afterlife. And here, this picture is just to give you a flavor of one thing, which is Total Recall gets rid of clutter. Uh, that was one thing we didn't quite appreciate until after you scan stuff and toss it out. It's like, wow, I can get, I had a huge filing cabinet I could get rid of and all this junk and stuff on your shelves says goodbye, so it's a, a very liberating kind of feeling. Memory. Human memory has all kinds of problems, from losing memories over time, uh, assigning memories to the wrong source, uh, bias, uh, people, this is why uh, they find problems with witnesses in court cases. They end up reciting things they read in a newspaper and believing that that's what they saw. Um, Absent-mindedness, you actually do remember it, but you just didn't remember it when you really needed to remember it. And you get home from the grocery store and you're kicking yourself that yet again you did not buy the kitty litter or whatever. And it's on the tip of your tongue, you can't, you can't bring it back. Those are just some examples of the problems of human memory. But of course, our e-memories are cold, hard, objective. They never get bored. They record all the tedium down to the, the last drop. And uh, I just want to show you a few uh, interfaces of the feeling of having more of your memory online. This is, a, uh, this is an interface done by Greg Smith in our Redmond lab and saying, okay, here's all Gordon's stuff and he wants to look at what do I have for last year. So it's going to refactor this to show what's available in the past year. And I'll say, well, okay, what, what do I have from Florida of last year? Let's drill in on location and uh, narrow down to Florida. And you see, oh yeah, there's the stuff from Florida of last year, but uh, maybe I don't want just last year. What, what's everything for Florida? Let's drop that restriction. And uh, I had to make this small for the little video capture I want to have it on, but here's the same interface on 18 LCD panels. And uh, this is, I think, where we're headed. You know, large displays and seeing the, the vista of our life laid out and being able to browse it and gain insights and see patterns in ways we never have before and just enjoy it. Uh, you know, when this is your, I, it's, it's hard for me to describe a lot of the things that we do 
when it's not your stuff, you go, oh, that's kind of interesting. I remember one prototype I came in with, and I went, this is amazing. Look, it's automatically you know, detecting such and such. And the, the guy in the next office goes, eh, big deal. And then he did it on his stuff. And he comes running back into my, wow, that's really cool, you know, when it's his stuff. And this, you know, when that's your life, it's amazing. You know, here's another example of working with memory. Um, I had an instance where there had been an email discussion about storage, and I remembered that that guy said that really cool thing. I want to look that up. So I, don't, I wasn't too good on search terms, but uh, and doing a search for storage got me down to only 5,500 emails. But by looking at the attributes that we had, looking at the who sent the mail and having it sorted by frequency, I was able to spot a name that I recognized and, and get to it. Or if you're recording, you're logging your phone calls and you know what's going on with your phone calls, now uh, let's say Gordon has a discussion with his real estate agent while he's selling his house and she says, here's a comp, look at this comparable property, bring up this web page. And he looks at it and they talk about it and he hangs up and now a week passes, two weeks, three weeks pass and he says, oh, I want to go back and check out that comparable property again. What's he going to search for? House, real estate, he'll get all these different pages he looked at. But instead, he starts with, well, I know who my real estate agent is, and let's uh, take the phone call with her and say what happened at the same time as that phone call. And then when he does that, not too much actually happened during the phone call, and we have a copy of the page, which is probably isn't on the web anymore because the house is already sold, but we can get back to it. So by bringing all these different things together from our life, we're able to hop from item to item, correlation, use correlations between them to start with your little memory hook and get to what you need to find. Now let's talk about health and how total recall will impact health. I visited Gordon at the hospital. He was uh, just recovering from bypass surgery and the doctor came into the room and said, oh, let's check you out. And he opened up his robe and looked at his chest and he says, yeah, oh, it's looking a bit better, I think. All right, well, it looks good. You should be able to get out this weekend. And he leaves the room. I said, what's that all about? And Gord says, well, I want to go home this weekend. It's my birthday, but they're worried that this rash on my chest is a sign of infection and they won't let me out if it's uh, not getting better. I said, oh, well, it's good that it's getting better then. He says, no, it's not getting better. I said, well, how do you know that? Well, because I've got my digital camera out and been taking a picture of it every day. And so I know that, in fact, it's not getting better at all, but the doctor believes it's getting better, so that's good enough. And so Gordon actually got to go home that weekend. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out to be a scary infection. But this is the nature of our health. So much of it is subjective right now or depends on our memory. When did you start feeling crummy? Oh, I think it looks a bit better. Or how long have you had this fever? I don't know, maybe since Tuesday. We want to change all that. Starting with our, our health records, um, even though patients' charts are available nearly all the time, most visits have problems with missing information. RAND thinks the U.S. could save 77 billion each year from adopting electronic health records. And there's estimates that it could also save as many as 100,000 lives every year. Um, clearly, our paper-based records aren't cutting it right now. We believe in health records by the individual for the individual. They're yours. You should have them. The problem is just bringing them all together because some are at the GP, some are at the hospital, some are at the specialist, some are at the lab. They're all over the place. Let's bring them all into one place where we can take advantage of them. And Gordon's actually done this, gone and collected all his records and uh, digitized them and has them available. This is an interface from University of uh, Pittsburgh called My Health Bits, looking at what would it be like to try and ha have something to manage all that yourself. Um, then let's go a step further. Besides the records that already exist, let's start keeping new records. Philips is already selling these devices uh, that are wirelessly or wired uh, transmitting data to a hub that can forward it up to the web and to your doctor or wherever you want it to go. So there's a scale, there's a blood pressure cuff. The lady in the picture there has a um, oxygen level uh, oximeter, I think they call it, on her finger to check uh, the blood oxygen level. And there's a glucose meter there, I think, is one of those. Uh, so these are already on the market. Uh, Gordon and I are both wearing these body bugs. So now we're, we're talking about wearables where you're tracking the calories that you burn and the number of steps that you take. And there's lots of fitness products along that line. We'll see more and more wearables tracking more and more values. 
And eventually we'll get into smart materials where it's just in our clothing, in our shoes, in our shirts, and it'll just be, uh, there's some, I saw some other work also at Dublin City University with uh, fabrics that are checking the pH in your sweat and noting when you're dehydrated or even checking on your posture uh, through your shirt. Eventually we reach the final frontier here of health sensing, which is in body, uh, you know, swallowing cameras, uh, having uh, wireless pressure sensors in your aneurysm sac that are wirelessly telling what the pressure is to the outside. Eventually we'll have things crawling around in our bloodstreams and uh, reporting on how things are looking. And what's the payoff? Well, we talked about this, you know, the doctor saying, when did you start feeling this way? Instead of me saying, gee, I'm not really sure. No, I want to walk in, here's the log of my blood pressure, here's the graph of my temperature, here's the hard data. Um, incentives, it turns out there's a big problem with people taking medications, uh, except painkillers, which have their own potent motivator. Um, but everything else people are pretty bad at, but it turns out there's a number of studies showing that it can be really helpful if you can see you know, some value your blood pressure actually going on, going down as you're taking your medication, then you're more likely to take your medication, it can help out. We could do data mining on this and discover correlations and find out the things that you're doing that tend to lead to being sick or um, we could have a even proactive advice, something kicking in saying, hey, you know what, you haven't been getting enough sleep, you better take some extra vitamin C or whatever, the, whatever your electronic nurse wants to advise you. And if we anonymize some of this data, uh, we can start getting involved in studies on a scale hard to imagine before I spoke with someone at Xerox Park yesterday who had done some early work in expert systems, taking data and mining it, and came up with publishable, publishable medical results showing uh, drug side effects. And he said, wow, this would be incredible. You know, it was so expensive and hard for us to even study a few thousand people. With this, if people were s felt safe with the uh, steps to anonymize, we could do studies much faster, much larger, and, and mine things for new results. Let's talk now about your everyday life and your afterlife. What do e-memories do for that? I overheard a woman in a restaurant, an uh, older lady, saying, I'm going to give you my cell phone number. Uh, you can't leave messages on my home phone because I saved too many from my grandson. And she just loaded up the old home answering machine and that was it. Because, and she, what does she want? Not just a transcript of what her grandson said. She wants to hear his voice. It's very precious to her. And there's a real uh, special quality to the kind of media that people are going to want to collect, uh, much richer storytelling that we get from it. And there's another uh, effect that we hadn't quite realized is that by digitizing everything, while most of my physical mementos used to sit in the attic or in a shoebox somewhere or maybe even in a really nice photo album but it's tucked away and it only comes out every few years, now they're on screen savers and of course we're getting more and more of these little uh, photo, photo um, stand kind of displays that can sit on your end table and uh, more and more displays everywhere. And now we're in just enjoying them more. They come out of the, out of the dust and, and onto our uh, living rooms. Uh, here's a shot, a timeline of pictures of Gordon's son. And down at the bottom is uh, the distribution in time of the photos, which didn't say anything to me. But Gordon said, oh yeah, I see. Well, they drop off here because uh, Brigham went to college then. And then there's a few spikes, those are family events, and then at the end there's another burst, and that's when the grandkids arrive. So to Gordon, even the data distribution tells a story. Of course, your location tells a story. Here's where I went on a, a trip to Los Angeles uh, with my kids, and I was taking my boys to some hockey games. And uh, here's the GPS of everywhere I went and the, the photos that I took. And, uh, then if I could, we segment by time and I could pick a, a particular trip here and animate driving back up to the hotel. And I got home and, and saw this once I sucked into the PC and I had my, my calendar also with all the games we were going to and I went, wow, I have enough here. Someone could just package this up. I could just send it to my mom and she'd have the story of how, what the grandkids did this weekend, which she's dying to hear, but I would never do the work to do. So we got an intern in doing automatic blogging based on this and, and did some cool, uh, cool versions of automatically telling the stories of your little episodes in your life. Going even further, 
If you're wearing one of these sense cams, you easily get several thousand photos a day. How do you tell that story? Uh, Dublin City University has a wonderful prototype of this, of working on event segmentation of those images. And then looking for faces, trying to find similar faces, looking at what people are wearing and how does that change. Looking at changes in the accelerometer to get an idea of activity changes. Looking at your GPS and where you are. And then based on that, they can say, well, you're in the usual place with the usual kind of faces and clothing, you know, no big deal. Or else they can tell you're doing something out of the ordinary. And so then they bring up this visual diary, as they call it, that makes the out of the ordinary things, the more novel things, big and shrinks down the stuff that's likely boring and you've done it a zillion times. And if you, in theirs, if you mouse over it, you see that stop motion playback of your life. So automatic summarization, telling the story of your day just based on shooting thousands of photos as you go. In the end, once we have all this stuff, what do we pass on to the next generation? Uh, Ed Feigenbaum, who's called the father of expert systems, had I had, got to have lunch with him one day and he drew this on a napkin. He said, here's how we thought things would be when we started working on expert systems. We'd have this logic module, we'd have this data module, and uh, you know, we'd go to town. But he said, years and years of experience showed us that the picture looks more like this. Lots and lots and lots of data and really less logic is often better. Well, when we get to e-memories, we've got lots and lots and lots of data to bring you. You know, based on just what Einstein left behind, Carnegie Mellon did an interactive system where you could ask Einstein questions. And if it was stuff published about him, he could virtually answer you. Uh, MyCyberTwin.com went through the Simpsons uh, transcripts and uh, allow you to chat with Bart Simpson. And uh, sounds a lot like Bart. And when you say, do you, do you have a pet? He can say, who needs a pet when I have Homer? And actually, but he does actually answer who his dog is. Now, but this data is, is trivial compared to what Gordon's recording in his life. And actually what Gordon's got, he's missed most of his life already. When we look at what the next generation will have, we'll have an incredible corpus of their usual phrases. What happened to them? We'll be able to really use their kind of expressions and simulate a person to uh, have a little taste of digital immortality. Total recall will be a revolution. It's going to shake up our society, uh, just like previous things that we call revolutions, like the Industrial Revolution or the, the PC Revolution. It's going to mean we live differently, and we're going to have to deal with it. We see that some of it, we think there's problems. There will be bugs to be fixed. And then there's some things that are just going to be changes, just like the fact that we have uh, vastly greater transportation today means we can get fresh fruit from the other side of the world is, you know, things are just different or that we can commute long distance in cars. One bug that we're going to have to deal with is uh, data decay, where uh, here's a little flight of fancy by Gordon of data writing to its application. Dear Appy, I thought we had a commitment. You were going to support me forever, but now you've abandoned me. Where are you? You know, you had this wonderful format and you stored something in it and now there's no app to play it back in anymore. I think there's going to be, uh, a, a, you know, another thing is outright data loss. So backup and replication is going to become a service that's much more mainstream than it even is today and in much more demand. And that coupled with that will be a service to roll forward formats and to keep them current or to warn people, you're in a kind of fringe format, that's risky. There's only, you know, 10 of you in the world using that thing. It might be gone pretty easily. Gordon and I put the ACM 97 a 50th anniversary meeting on the web and um, a few years, it didn't take that many years before we got an email saying I can't play one of the videos. So I contacted the Windows media team. I said, guys, come on, let's get this codec posted. We got to play this video. A few days later they replied and said, well, we had a license uh, to play that. The company that owned the license went bankrupt. It's in receivership. Uh, there's no one to go to to get a new license and for us to release the codec would be breaking the law. So, I mean, there's a totally dead format. So we have to watch out for that. How about privacy? What will this do to our privacy? We're going to have to develop etiquette in our society about when is it acceptable to record each other and laws that deal with that even. Um, but already we have to grapple with privacy. Already you may be posted on don'tdatehimgirl.com, 
with warnings of what a jerk you are, or of course we all know about embarrassing videos on YouTube and pictures and whatnot. Um, Steve Mann does a funny experiment where he and a bunch of people wear these t-shirts that say, for your protection you may be recorded, and all criminal acts prosecuted, they're trying to kind of echo the words of what we see in surveillance cams, and they wander around with these things and watch people in stores and, and various museums and various places panic. And uh, they get a big kick out of that. And it turns out you don't even need to have a camera to make people upset because it's the mere possibility that you might be recorded that's going to change your behavior and make you worried. And in a way, we're already there. Already recording is so miniaturized that you might be recorded and you don't even know it. And so some of this isn't so much even what we're advocating people do. You know, we're not telling you you ought to record video and audio 24-7. We're telling you that more and more e-memories will have more and more benefits, but even without us saying anything, even if you know the book didn't exist, we weren't advocating anything, there's already, we're hitting a point where a society has to grapple with what does it mean that I might be recorded. Then there's the uh, legal side of things. Will my e-memories testify against me? Um, so one idea is maybe I could just get some of them wrong on purpose. If I put in some junk in there that's, you know, false, then that won't be any good in court. Uh, some of the people at USC were working on that idea, but then some lawyers have told them, no, nah, that's not going to cut it. Um, could we change the law? We think the law probably should change. It, there's been some interesting rulings lately. Uh, one judge said that a man didn't have to give an encryption key to the cops. I uh, said, no, that's, that's testifying against himself, and more like that. So that's a int very interesting ruling, and we'll see how, whether that holds up. Um, in another case, a judge ruled that, well, okay, if you do have to hand it over, the standard should be higher. It should be more like having a strip search than just having to hand over some papers. So recognizing this is more intimate than kind of maybe your typical paperwork. And we think, really, it's an extension of your brain, and it should be given that kind of legal protection. I'd like to put all my memories in a Swiss data bank. So just like a Swiss bank, hides money and it's plausibly deniable and no one knows whether it's there, that's where I want to stash all my memories. I want someone to store it for me. And I'd like to have a second password, which is the uh, I'm compromised password, where I log in and it goes off and it shreds all the nasty stuff. So we were doing all this recording and I've been doing quite a lot of it myself too. And I thought, well, this is kind of fun. It's kind of a novelty. And in particular, recording every web page that I visited. And then here's a timeline of my web, some of my web pages from uh, 2003, I think it is. And there's a gap in the middle there, which is where my hard drive crashed and I hadn't backed up for four months. And that day I had an epiphany. I went from going, oh, this is a novelty, to going, oh, no. I'm really upset that I lost a bunch of my memories, was the way I thought of it. It was very distressing to me. And I found that after that, I would go looking for things, expecting them to be there, and they weren't, they'd been lost. And it dawned on me, oh, this isn't just fun and games. I mean, I count on it. I rely on the fact that if I've seen a web page, I've got it forever. And that it actually is life-changing. We talk about the era before humans did any writing as prehistory. It's almost like it doesn't count wasn't in the record. Well, I think soon we'll talk about pre-total recall. We'll talk about those, those people back before when all you had was a few shoe boxes and a bunch of papers, and you're lucky if you left that behind. That really, the e-memory revolution is going to change up everything and really uh, make us live different lives. Thanks. <laughs> so I guess we have time for some questions. Well, you still do have to remember. That's a great question. You, you know, um, apparently Plato was concerned about this in terms of writing. He said, oh, no, our memories are going to go to hell now because you guys are writing stuff down. What a terrible idea writing is. Uh, ironically, we know this because it was written down. Um, but it's the same thing here. Uh, my mind is still full to overflowing of things that I have to memorize. The difference is what do I memorize? So I'm not memorizing phone numbers anymore, they're on my cell phone. Or I'm not memorizing things that I know I can w look up quickly in my system in a few seconds, 
but I'm still, je I mean, there's still things that you want on the tip of your tongue you want to be able to say right away without even a five second look up. And uh, there always will be. So I hope it just frees us up to think different things. Over here. Reinforcing your point, uh, Plato was nothing compared to Pythagoras, Buddha, Jesus, the whole Celtic Druids, all uh, great spiritual uh, uh, feelings uh, that basically f never wrote down a single word, forbade their disciples from ever writing down a single word. Of course, the disciples disobeyed, which is why we know anything about all of them, but because a dead, uh, the written word is a dead word. But I, I found it particularly interesting that you picked the Swiss data bank example when less than a month ago, a Swiss uh, bank just agreed to give all the secret data on tens of thousands of US taxpayers, or rather not uh, quite fully taxpayers, to the US government. And uh, more uh, beyond the Fifth Amendment, Fifth Amendment has never been uh, applied to non-physical uh, individuals as opposed to other provisions of constitutional laws. As uh, Microsoft knows well, and basically everybody, the more you put in email, the only, uh, the closest thing we have to total recall today, the more uh, toast you are whenever anybody sues you. So um, how can any company uh, support uh, any recording at all going on inside their buildings when it can be definitely subpoenaed and used against them in court because there is no Fifth Amendment you wanna, you wanna do this protection. I, yeah, I, I know that's the, uh, the corp, certainly the corporate uh, view is to get rid of everything. I don't know what, uh, what it is here. I know Intel, I did some consulting for a while with Intel and they were probably the strongest in terms of cleaning out everything. Now. The, be the beauty of doing that, it lets you reinvent things every, uh, every few years. But uh, I, I subscribe to th that you're going to win more than you, you lose when you are able to have a long, uh, a long record uh, of, some, of something. So, but uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I can't support it. I just have, I just, it's just a belief that I, that I, I, you know, also, I think, isn't this a great challenge for Google? I mean, when yeah. I think of storing things in Gmail, yeah. you guys need to come up with a system where you can't give it over to the government. You never see anything but it's encrypted. As I said, where there's escape passwords that, that shred stuff for you. I mean, th there's a lot of innovation left to do here. And uh, I sure hope uh, people here at Google jump all over it and, and deliver some new ideas that are different than, the, than that Swiss data bank that we just talked about. There are a couple situations where it's either clearly illegal or it's of dubious legality to photograph. And I'm thinking of situations like riding the subway in New York or going to watch a movie or there have been a lot of incidents lately about people videotaping law enforcement actions. Um, how do you make this kind of recording uh, consistent with, uh, with that kind of uncertain legal environment? I think, I think the, the laws are going to determine that, you know, as technologists, we'll be providing, providing the fodder for cre the cre creation and the de definition of the laws. Uh, but all we can do is observe that they are, either we're creating them or uh, our friends or you are, we're all together here creating these kinds of opportunities with the technology and as you go there, uh, we'll we'll hit these boundaries, and then those boundaries will will determine each state, each country determines them uh, uh, quite differently. And so you just have to be aware uh, <laughs> when you go into a country. I mean, for example, you know, uh, it's, I spent a fair amount of time in Sydney, and even photographing some of the public buildings, if they're if it's going to be for commercial use, uh, Sydney uh, expects you to. Uh, pay for a picture of the opera house if it's going to be used uh, in some uh, some some some, uh, some money making venture and in fact we uh, that's why we had a very subdued music with this because uh, we we regard that as fair use but when it's when it's played uh, uh, on YouTube of course uh, and you're helping define all of those by the way uh, YouTube helps define what what's fair use I think the other aspect is Gordon talked about use for commercial use. 
we're talking here about a lot of things that will be recorded and no one else will ever see. And a lot of, you know, a lot of laws, it'll be one thing to have a law forbidding recording where the rubber really meets the road is whether you share it with anybody. And uh, so, you know, sometimes I wonder whether people will obey these laws any more than they obey posted speed limits where they know no cops are around. Um, I, I think there's going to be a lot of working out. I, I, a lot of it, I think, is cultural as much as legal. You know, will there be a special bond between people who don't record? Or will there be a special bond if I trust you to record everything? Or how will it work out, you know? And, and laws will change different countries, as Gordon says. Well, there's a, there's, uh, as we were writing the book, there's a, a book out there uh, by a woman who basically has a two-way associative video camera built into her, her brain. I mean, she's, she, you know, she has a hard time living with herself because these images are constantly there. But she can retrieve any by day, or she can retrieve by image. Or so, in a in a way, she is a walking absolute video, the ultimate of what we expect. So you, if you hired her to, to be part of something, why well you basically are, are getting a, a recorder of, uh, of, this, of this capability. So do you, so just to follow up on the previous question, um, do you record any audio conversations other than the ones on the phone? Like any face-to-face -face conversation? Uh, very rarely, I, I record a few. I've got a video. I've got an audio recorder. I'm not. Re we're not recording this because we were. It was cap captured. Uh, I happen to b be a strong believer in recording meetings, audio recording of meetings, particularly, so that you can can go back and and uh, and find out what they have. In fact, I was help fund one a company, and I'm not exactly sure where they are at. At this point, the company called Quindy that has a has a audio and video capture of, of meetings. Um, okay, I li well, so I this like kind of voids the 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 issue <coughs> of the previous question with regard to to wiretapping yeah. conversations. But You've got but to but how do you so? But I, I mean, I heard you kind of talk about the future changes in the law in response to the previous question. But what do you guys personally do yourselves well, oh now? Do you actually go around and pay attention to the laws of what things you're not allowed to photograph and turn off your, your things? I mean, practically, are you just assuming that you know, you're probably gonna be fine, you know, it's like five miles an hour over the speed limit, or are you paying careful attention to exactly where you are and what the law is there and what you're not allowed to photograph and when you need to, I mean, it I seems like a hard work, right? I think we're okay. But For the record, I put it in my pocket when I yes. walked past the big sign in the hallway here that had your secret sauce on it. And I. So. And I and I turned mine over. <laughs> but uh, a actually, a lot of laws are fairly lenient with picture taking, especially in public places. Uh, for your own use, it's fair game. It's the audio gets really, really sensitive where there's this presumption of privacy. And also, that, that's more natural in a way, if you will. Like when we're out with people and you see cameras around, we kind of, that's normative here in this country anyhow. But when you record audio, people are more sensitive and we tend to let them know, okay, is it okay if I record this conversation or this meeting or whatever we're in? I do record some phone, phone conversations uh, periodically. I tell the people, uh, I had a long, long CNN interview and the guy said, I'm, said, I'm recording this and I said, okay, I'm gonna record it too um, because it turned out there were a lot of interesting mm -hmm. uh, questions uh, from, the, uh, from the interview. What are your thoughts about the emotional value of memories that will never go away? In other words, uh, wouldn't nostalgia be, uh, and it'll be different from what it used to be? Yeah, so even there's memories that, uh, usually people say even, well, there's bad memories that I want to forget, and isn't it more healthy for me to forget things? And. Uh, what that misses is there's a wonderful distinction between electronic memory and human memory. That with human memory, when people say, oh, I really ought to forget that, what they really mean is I really ought to stop recalling it. It's not that they have it in their memory, but that they're having, you know, flashbacks of the war, or they're having, you know, they can't stop dwelling on that fight they had with their girlfriend or what have you. Um, and with an e-memory, we can do that. You can say, okay, seal this off you know, not for access unless I give the key or however you want to do it, you know, just hide it away. 
Um, so there's a lot, there is a difference there in terms of we could keep things that maybe later, maybe years down the road, you'd be really glad you had or uh, might be useful. We had one lady call in and say, oh, I had a son who was bipolar and the memories of his childhood are just horrible and I, you know, I would hate to think of having kept them. Uh, but actually, if you think about it, yeah, she probably wants to lock them down and she doesn't want them uh, bothering her, but maybe when that, guy, when that kid is 25, that might be incredibly valuable stuff for his therapist. Uh, so you never know. And another related one is, even for the good memories, we sometimes see more value in them when we haven't seen them for a while. As opposed to, say, if you had uh, pictures of your childhood all around you all the time, wouldn't you kind of get bored and not see the, uh, not be as happy about them as if you could see them every five years or whatever? R having, having some kind of ranking, particularly when it's uh, this sort of memory refresh, we almost look like that is like, is it's like dynamic RAM that you're you're periodically looking at that and those things are are coming into your memory uh, and uh, uh, we have a control so that you you can say well that's not so important but you can sort of what you want to do is really be able to have a, a, a kind of a quality threshold of all of these uh, of that you know when you're when is that when it's in screensaver mode. Yeah, you want to, you know, talk about a ranking problem. It's really interesting. When you make it purely random, if you have more pictures or something, then of course they'll show up. And uh, I had somebody else's collection of a thousand photos on my hard drive for some reason, and I, I keep seeing these photos. And like you say, it's like, that's boring, I don't want them. So there's some work here to do on how do we, uh, how do we figure out that because I was hitting skip on the screensaver, you know, skip to the next photo, you ought to be able to learn that I'm getting bored of that collection, you know, hide it for the next six months and then we'll kind of try it out on me again and see whether I've changed my mind. I have a question. There's, there's a lot of uh, work that looked like getting implicit metadata on time, place, people, uh, routine, things like that, which is really good. But I'm curious, does the system keep track of how long you actually are using the system to go back and use it? Yeah, we were, tra we were tracking, uh, tracking all that, yes. Okay, but I mean, as a percentage of time, I mean, this is sort of a follow-on question, is it seems very backward focused. In other words, it's sort of encouraging you to go back and revisit things and correlate and so forth. And I'm curious, you know, what has it let you do that you otherwise couldn't going ahead or going forward? Well. well First of all, no, I don't think we, I mean, aside from, of course, we were building this experimentally and it's, you know, bailing wire and bubble gum and, and there's some pain involved. But apart from that, I don't think, no, it does make us look back more or, or get more focused on the past or anything like that. But it does enable, it's, it's just like we've got it there. So I don't spend, you know, and people really, th these cameras get a lot of attention, but think about, to me, it was having every copy of every web page that I visited. That didn't mean I spent a lot of time looking at, oh, let's look at old web pages, because that, that's you boring. I never do that. But what I do all the time is go, oh, I need to get back to that page. And you know, think of how many of your customers, it was like a seven step thing of they did a search and they clicked on something and they followed and they followed until they finally got to the page they wanted. And then the next time for them to repeat that, okay, what's the magic incantation? What are the links to follow? It's much easier when you're getting out of your own, own collection. Now, do you have any? Yeah, no. I Speak to the flip side of this. So clearly everything is getting recorded. Like I stand here, I can see two cameras over there, two cameras over there, one camera over there. Everything I do is getting recorded, even if it, you weren't carrying it on your, around your neck. Uh, but would you, can you talk about the society we will get when everything is recorded and everything is searchable? So if you're in Soviet Russia and everything is recorded and you really cannot hide, like in 1984, what happens? I mean, what happens to, what kind of a society will we get? You want to uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I th the most publicity, I think, uh, it's not, not Russia, but in the UK. I mean, the real examples, I think, of, of I'll take spectacular finds are really from all the cameras in, the, in, in, in Britain. They, they have, a, I, I don't know, more cameras per area. 
Jason Tom, I, I believe. We're getting, I notice we're getting more, more and more, whether it's in an airport or, or wherever. Uh, it's kind of, I've always thought it would be very interesting having, you know, when all of these media, like this room or so, I don't have to have the thing, but I, I'll say, I want to go back to the room. I'll say, room, tell me about this. So uh, I think that, I think we'll get to this point. I think there'll be a point where, see, I had a meeting in that room. I forget what, I forget what went on at the room. I think that, I think that these things will take on, on this capability, like a car, you know, a car, car, what did I do? Where did I go, car? And, you know, then you get into the thing, can the car testify against you? And that's already happening because the car, the car knows where it's been and it knows how fast and all of these things. And so you get into this privacy of the car, privacy of these objects are, are happening or yeah, will happen. Yeah, and I think this raises a great, point, <laughs> a great point that we already are being recorded so much that in, in one sense, if you aren't doing recording of your life, you might be the only one who isn't. You know, the government, your bank, every, your credit card company, they know all about you, but you're kind of clueless. You, do, you don't know your patterns as well as they do. But then what do you do if the government turns evil? Or it doesn't, um, I mean, or you're doing something that the government doesn't like. You're so in China and you're speaking up against the party. What do you do? I mean, you well, so, hide. so what about, I think it'd be wonderful if we wanted to advocate for governments to do less recording. Right? I think the, the individual, you know, we can work out what we believe about recording each other and so on, but if we want to say the government, you should be doing less recording, that's great. That's totally different than what we're talking about. In the book, we're not advocating that governments record us or, or right. each other. We're saying your memories, like an extension of your brain, right? I, I'm with you. If you want to do some kind of petition to slow down the government, I'm there. We're, by the way, the focus on the book is strongly around the individual and what is it do, yeah, what do you get? Right? You know, what the individual gets by having more and more things recorded. You know, and the thing is, well, do we wear these cameras? Do we take more pictures? No, do we record this or that? And I say, not really, you know, as people who are work, work with computers and, and uh, other people in the knowledge industry, what we need it for usually is, we've got this enormous amount of traffic going back and forth, most of it, in email and all of the stuff that's on our screen, we want all of that to be recorded because that really is our, that's really where the payoff is in a professional life. Or in a personal life, it's uh, every transaction, every financial transaction that goes on so that when we uh, you know, do our income tax or have to fill out a travel form or anything like that, that that stuff is all there for us. The fact that we, We've gone paperless. I was paperless in 2002. And, you know, it just makes life so much nicer to have, have to have, to not have to think about any of those, uh, those, those documents, any of the bills and stuff like that. And uh, the bank, banks and all the financial guys are now trying to make, please go paperless. We don't want to, you know, they want to save money. But from our standpoint, from any user standpoint, it's a great advantage because you can finally find something <laughs> that yeah, you well, couldn't have found. Didn't you recently have to tell Australia every time you'd be in and out of the country? Or oh, something yeah. Like and now, uh, and it no Australia knows. So um, right now you're wearing cameras around your neck. You're carrying yeah. voice recorders in your pocket. Um, I imagine to get uh, sort of wider adoption on something like this, you'd need uh, some kind of less conspicuous hardware. Have you uh, spent any time thinking about that? What's your vision on, uh, on what's this going to look like? <laughs> uh, Actually, so Lindsay Williams, who invented this, her goal ultimately was to have it as a nice little bit of jewelry that she'd be able to put on her dress. And really, you know, this is just a prototype. So it's literally some other digital camera ripped apart and stuck in here with these sensors. It could really, really shrink down. And we think it should be, it could be fashionable in clothing, you know. It already, the miniaturization is there. It's just yeah. how we pack it up. You can stuff it into an iPod Nano now, no problem, go, right? Go to either the Russian, uh, uh, or there are a bunch of spy stores around. So you can, <laughs> uh, depending on how much you want to pay, you can. But do you envision uh, people like, actually embedding these uh, things in their, in their bodies somehow? Uh, so you, you don't even have to wear it as a, 
as an item of uh, clothing or jewelry or something like that? Uh, for record, I don't know whether that's going to happen for recording. We've got a long way to go before people get any value out of it. The, the big, the big problem with all of the all the audio stuff I've got, you know, well, two or three thousand uh, telephone conversations. I stopped doing it because it was only only a few cases that I want to transcribe stuff. The value wasn't there. So as engineers, you know, it was it was like we did all this stuff to find out what's the value in in them. Do do you want to bother with it? You know, is it paying off? So I, our stuff is strongly payoff uh, driven. If there were good speech to text, if there were great speech to text, better than that. If you had great speech to text, believe me, you'd want there will be recording going going on all the time. I that's what the only reason you don't record off people don't have to record audio. It takes as long to to uh, listen to the stuff as it did to have the original. Uh, whereas text, uh, you know, all over email and stuff like that. See, you can read that stuff so fast. Computers can read it, but a computer basically can't take audio. Can't you know can barely take video in terms of uh, does it know anything about it? It's what does the computer know? You know, so we were strongly it, it isn't really information unless the computer knows it, or it isn't valuable. It isn't valuable to us unless the computer knows about it. Yeah, I think also as we talk about this growing starting now, where's the value? The value is in what's everything I've ever read as a knowledge worker. What's all my health data to deal with my health? And then when you get into pictures, I think it's. You know, when can someone make one of these that's really easy to take on vacation and come back and do your travel log, right? They, it's not so much miniaturized and go, you know, it's a big jump to talk about the society that's 24-7 recording. As we ramp up along what's valuable enough for us to bother with, it's going to be these kind of applications. Oh, by the way, we should mention that we had the, we had the books back, back there and sign them and there are, there are a dozen I think we have we got us to 10 startup ideas for stuff that we wanted so we wanted to stimulate people because we see the industry already that there are are uh, products and features coming out that are really memory enhancement based uh, I appreciate that you're, you're sort of looking for the positive things and, and looking yeah. how to uh, kind of move forward, but it seems to me that uh, y you also have to uh, take responsibility for looking at the negative side, looking at the dystopian side as well, because, y you know, s some of your comments about, well, uh, you know, somebody brings up an objection, what if this happens, and you say, well, the laws have to change. The laws won't change in a positive way unless people have examined both sides of things, you know, otherwise the law is going to be reactive. and and, and and you know, as 1984 showed, the government doesn't have to record everything if they can get convince your neighbors to do it for you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, necessarily the government recording everything you do if, if your neighbor walks out and, and and you know walks through the street every day. They'll have a pretty good picture of what's going on in your in your in your neighborhood. So, um, like I said, well, I, I do appreciate you know, what you're looking for, I think it would also be good to, to really focus on some of the problems that come up as well. Well, well you're right. And, and we spent some time in the book talking about these problems of what, what does the revolution mean to us. And one of our points is probably more than big brother, you need to worry about little brother, exactly as you said. And the electronic gossip is the, is the biggest threat that probably will face us in the short term. Uh, and again, that we face that now. That's already here. So even if nobody reads our book or pays any attention to us, we are already at that point where little brother could be spying on you and gossiping about you. And that we need to come to grips with it. We need to, you know, whether it's developing new laws or whether, uh, you know, as technologists, are, are there things we can do? I mean, can we develop devices that will, will share permissions with each other about what you can record and say, yeah, you're allowed to record me. No, you're not. I trust you. I don't trust you. I, I'm just speculating here by saying, yeah, these are real problems, and we have to come to grips with them, and we, and we have to now. So uh, part of what we're saying, too, about it being inevitable is it's here. It's happening. 
even the people who think, I don't want any, to have anything to do with this, it's coming. You know, I, I think even the people who say, I don't want anything to do with this, will still record their life on a scale that will blow away everyone from the previous century. I mean, that, that'll, be, that'll be, you know, last century will be considered nothing, absolutely nothing, for you to max out what you would have had from the 20th century. And that, yeah, we're going to grapple with it. It's here, so what are we going to do about it? It's not us advocating should we or shouldn't we. It's going to happen. All right. Well, well, gentlemen, thank you very much for speaking with us today. It was a great, a great presentation. Thank you. You're welcome.